chapter one of Intel Africa by Sam Manigan. I felt as if John and I were almost floating over the perfect asphalt. The ride was wonderfully smooth and there were none of the usual rattling bike on rough road sounds. We clicked along comfortably at 90 kilometres an hour. Not too fast to miss the scenery and not too fast to deal with the ever-present risk of a dashing animal, but fast enough to feel that we were getting somewhere. The day was slightly overcast with clouds that were tinged only with silver grey and not the menacing purple grey of a coming storm. Rising gently, the road no longer shimmered in the heat and for once we didn't feel overdressed. As we drew closer to the last major town on the road to the Malawi border, huts and mud brick shops began to appear along the roadside. Hand-painted signs advertised fruits and vegetables alongside garish posters for Omo washing powder, flour and cigarettes. We slowed down for each cluster of buildings, nervous of dogs, goats and children. The traffic thickened rapidly and the little clusters of buildings merged into continuous outskirts. A few hundred metres in front, a bus was pulling over to the side. I slowed right down. When a bus pulls a halt in Africa, life explodes. There's a mad rush to get off, to drag belongings off the giant roof rack, to search out friends in the milling confusion. There never seem to be any toilets, so there's always a dash for the bushes too. Travelling by bike, I at least had the chance to pee in sweet-smelling peace and quiet, but bus drivers don't have that luxury. What they do get is a full-on choice of refreshments whenever the bus stops. Street vendors selling fruit, soft drinks, skewered goat meat, samosas or plastic bags full of fresh pineapple cubes all rushed into the chaos with the hope that passengers leaning out of the windows would buy something for the journey. I'd seen enough African bus stops by the time I made it to Tanzania to know that no one would be looking out for a passing motorcycle. Slowing even more, the worst of the rush had pretty much cleared from the road by the time we got close. With the headlight on full beam and my thumb on the horn, I felt sure that as usual we'd make it through the chaos. We didn't. There on the road stood an amuse who was carefully looking both ways before stepping out into the road. I'd never seen anyone do that before in Africa. Normally, the inevitable potholes, the condition of the vehicles or the enthusiastic yells of the conductors meant that a pedestrian could hear something coming. They wouldn't need to look. The old man stared straight at us and hesitated before trying to make it across, but try he did. With just two steps he was in front of us. There was no time to react as the front wheel hit him with a sickening thump. As we hit the road, I saw him somersault, almost in slow motion, over to the rubbish-strewn roadside. Somehow, I ended up on my feet with just the sleeve of my jacket scratched, but John was rolling in agony in the middle of the road. Seeing there wasn't a lot that I could do for him, I rushed over to the bike where petrol was spewing out over the hot engine. A passerby helped me pick it up from where it had landed almost upside down in the ditch. Another spectator yelled in Swahili, You must not move your machine, the police will be coming. After squatting down to turn the petrol off, I looked up to see that I was surrounded. Above me, all except for a small oval of blue-grey, shadowy black places that closed off the sky. I was scared. There were many stories about what happened to other bikers who'd been unlucky enough to hit someone in Africa. Some had only just escaped with their lives, and some hadn't escaped at all. The crowd stood watching silently as we eased him into the back of the pickup truck, and there I got my first proper sight of the man who'd been knocked over. He sat leaning against the back of the cab, and to my complete horror, a part of his leg stood foot to the floor in a growing pool of dark red blood. I'd somehow managed to take it off below the knee, and his stump was spurting regular jets of blood. I was stunned for a moment, and then yelled at them to get him to hospital quickly. I had no idea how long he'd been sitting there in that state, but they shouldn't have waited for John. Putting a tourniquet on him never entered my mind. The police arrived with an air of considerable authority, and with a flourish of self-importance, they set about making notes and drawing diagrams. An old-fashioned tape measure in a circular wooden case was produced, and they made me show them where the impact had been. They looked down the road to where the bike was, and shaking their heads, measured the distance. I asked Joseph what the problem was. They say that your machine has slid a long way. It had. Even at a touch less than 20 kilometres per hour, 
The brand new smooth asphalt, smooth luggage and long sloping camber had carried the heavy bike at least 25 feet. Beginning to shake and with a queasy stomach, the feeling that it was all a dream washed over me. While the police measured, I found the point that the man had landed and a large red stain in the dust told it all. To the left of the stain, a three-foot spike of angle iron was sticking out of the ground. At some time in the past, there had been a sign there, but when it was taken down, removing the spike had presumably been too much effort. The man had hit the spike on his fall. If it hadn't been there, he would almost certainly have still had his leg. After following them to the police station, my bike... My keys, carnet, licence, passport and money were all confiscated. I wondered if I'd ever see any of them again. The booking end room was a mass of yelling, arguing people and to top it all, after just a few moments of being in the chaos, a badly beaten up man was thrown to the floor inside the room. His ears and nose had blood pouring from them and he looked no more than semi-conscious. They thrust me into a cell and it was like being shoved onto the set of a movie. The concrete cell reeked of urine and a bucket in the corner stunk of faeces. The room was lit only by a small barred window that was set high into the wall. A single dust-filled shaft of light cut into the dank darkness. As my eyes got used to the gloom, I realised that there was a group of men already there. All of their eyes were on me. The hair on the back of my neck moved under the collar of my leather jacket, and trying to look taller than my 6'1", I leant against the wall and stared back. I was scared again, but had the feeling that if I didn't look tough, there'd be trouble. Almost everywhere on the trip so far, there'd been a sort of guarded respect towards me. I'd never really been sure if it was the colour of my skin, my comparative wealth or what I was doing that engendered this respect. But there wasn't a trace of it now. Time passed in slow motion and my mouth went dry. I couldn't stop trembling and all I wanted to do was sit down. Then, the largest man opened his flies and took out his erect penis. With a touch of the bazaar, as he took his first step towards me, the shaft of light from the window hit him and made him centre stage. Masturbating as he came closer, I suddenly knew what an animal felt like when it was rooted to the spot by zooming headlights in the dark. There was no mistaking what was in this guy's mind. Tanzania has a major AIDS problem, and besides that... A self-preservation instinct took over and without thinking I behaved totally out of character. I thrashed out at the two nearest men with all the strength that fear and frustration could muster. Whilst pounding at them for those few moments, I was yelling, guard, guard, and he came running. The door swung open. The beam of light stayed right on the big man who stood still with his erect penis in his hand. The guard dragged me out and angrily thrust me into an empty room. I sat and shook. I felt disgust and wanted to vomit. Next, we had to go to the traffic chief's office. He told me via Joseph that I was going to have to appear in court for speeding. They were sure that the bike had slid too far. Arguing as best I could that they had no experience of how far a bike of this size would slide on a brand new road surface that didn't even have a gravel coating made no difference. The road had been severely potholed for the previous 10 years and most of the local bikes were much lighter 125cc trail bikes. They did give my bike back but kept most of my papers. The news from the hospital was that the man was still alive and the police told me that there was going to be a speeding charge. If that was the case, then it made sense to pay the fine and say no more, but I couldn't help feelings of guilt. We were kept waiting for hours at the police station the next day. Then we were told when I had to be in the court and what the charges were going to be. The charges were speeding, driving without due care and attention, and attempt to commit grievous bodily harm. I was stunned. Not only were there two traffic violations, but a criminal charge as well. They were saying that I'd actually driven at the man on purpose. Joseph was as amazed as we were. He'd little inkling at this time what was going to happen. If I was found guilty, I'd be back in jail and properly this time. The prosecuting officer worked hard at trying to persuade me to plead guilty. If you do, she said, you'll be on your way in no time. This seemed to be an odd prediction after pleading guilty to serious charges, so of course I refused. I wasn't guilty, and common sense pointed out that promises of freedom could easily be broken, and pleading guilty could open a whole new can of worms. On the day of the hearing, I was made to stand out in the dusty, high-walled courtyard with all the other rogues and villains. 
The smooth rendered walls made the yard feel like an open-air cell. Naturally, John and I were the centre of attention. Eventually my name was called. John, Con, Joseph were allowed into the courtroom too. The charges were read and everyone seemed amazed at my firm, not guilty response. The black-robed magistrate looked across at the prosecuting officer with a question mark on his face. There was silence in the room and then the magistrate, shuffling his papers with a sharp tap onto the bench, said, The police must have time to collect evidence and therefore the case will go to the regional court in one month. My jaw must have dropped open. One month? Please, sir, that's an awfully long time, I said to the magistrate, who looked at me in surprise. Oh, well, he said. Um, how about two weeks? I thought quickly and decided not to push my luck any further. Thank you, sir. Two whole weeks, and John needed to head back to Kenya for his flight home, but there was really no choice but to accept it. Then another surprise. The magistrate asked if there was someone who would stand bail for me. I looked at Con, who shocked me by shaking his head. I didn't know then that you had to be a Tanzanian citizen to stand bail for anyone in Tanzania. Joseph, a man who'd known me for just a few days, stood and agreed to put his farm up as bail. His farm was a house he'd built himself, a shed, an acre of land, two cows and half a dozen chickens. That was just about all he had to feed himself and his family. His pension from the Tanzanian army was just £20 sterling per year. I was stunned at his selfless generosity. While we were waiting for the bail officer to turn up, Joseph disappeared for 45 long minutes. I have to admit that I thought he'd suddenly realised the enormity of his commitment and had disappeared for good before the papers could be signed. But, before we'd gone into court, I told him that whatever happened, I was going to do my best for the injured man. I'd buy a wooden leg and give enough money to keep him and his family going for two years. At least that way, he had a chance to get as well as possible, and no one was going to suffer further than was unavoidable because of my holiday. I told Joseph that he should tell no one about this before the trial was over, in case someone took it as an admission of guilt. He told me that the man was a shoe repairer, and that a wooden leg would not stop him earning his living once he was well again. At least that was something. Confusion, waiting, and general lack of activity was the rule for much of the rest of the day. But a crowd was starting to collect and there were lots of sideways looks in our direction. It wasn't until after two that we were told to go through the crowds into the courthouse. The building was set in a shallow amphitheatre where spectators sat watching through the windows and listening to the relayed reports from inside. A small boy stood listening from the doorway and periodically he would rush out to shout what was happening. Men with trays walked through the people selling oranges and boiled sweets. Boys with old galvanised buckets hawked unshelled peanuts and soft iced drinks. The carnival was in town. I suspected the fact that a Mazungu was on trial was just added spice. Finally, at three o'clock, I was called to the stand and the court fell completely silent. Mr Sam, under Tanzanian Law Code number 4783, you were advised that all charges against you have been withdrawn. When we arrived on the ward, a large part of the family was there to greet us. I was nervous, but a little voice was telling me that I didn't need to be there at all. But I did. And on being introduced, I shook the weak hand that was being held in my direction. To my amazement, Mr Sanger said sorry. To me. I don't remember what I said to him first, but gave him the money and the receipt for the wooden leg, and told him that I hoped that he would get fit soon. It was soon clear that he was exhausted, so we headed for the door. His older brothers came with us to deliver the punchline. They told us that they hoped the incident hadn't spoiled our visit to Tanzania too much, and that we'd still be able to leave with good memories of the country and its people. And anyway, the oldest brother said, he always had one leg shorter than the other, now he can have two the same length.